also a description of each of the paintings, uh, can be found in the exhibition catalog, which I know that some of you have already uh, started reading, which I'm delighted by. Let's see, so um, rather than reiterate the same material that I cover in the catalog, I wanted to give you a little bit of history about academic art, so the kind of art that, that I make here, where did this come from, um, and so forth. And if any of you have any questions while I'm going through the lecture, feel free to interrupt me and raise your hand, or um, because of course I don't want to lose anyone, so uh, feel free to jump right in. Now anyone who takes a survey course on art history will encounter the word academicism uh, in the context of 19th century French art, and usually as a term, I'm sorry to say, of derision, uh, speaking of the reactionary establishment uh, that opposed the French avant-garde. Now, the academic tradition had a long history prior to becoming embattled with the painter of modern life. Uh, the first academy of painting and sculpture was founded in Florence in uh, 1563 by Giorgio Vasari, who was, of course, uh, the famous biographer and friend of Michelangelo's, as well as uh, a fine artist in his own right. The, uh, the purpose of the academies was to codify the tradition of Italian Renaissance art and to pass it on to future generations. Uh, Vasari christened the first such institution, the Academia, uh, with a nod to Plato's Academy, because he thought of painting uh, as a philosophical enterprise. Now, in fact, the academies did not actually teach uh, the craft of painting or sculpture as such, since the rudiments of craftsmanship were not learned in school, but by apprenticeship. Uh, the academic curriculum dealt exclusively with the intellectual side of the art, which included drawing and theory, basically. Um, in the academy, students learned how to draw from the live model uh, and from plaster casts and antique sculptures, actually, as I myself did studying at the Angel Academy in Italy. And so if you look uh, back in the corner there, you can see an example of some academic figure drawing that I did. And unfortunately, it's probably a little hard to see from where you're sitting, but there's also a cast drawing in the corner right where you come in and you may want to take a look at that later to get a sense of the kinds of things that students had to do when they were studying at the academies. Now, um, but fundamentally what the academies really taught beyond just how to draw uh, was how to practice painting and sculpture and architecture as a liberal art, and that, that's really the key. Now, it's a well-known fact that prior to the Italian Renaissance, um, painting was seen as a mere craft and the painter as a mere craftsman. Painting was a way of making things, but not a way of knowing things. A skill, but not really a liberal art. Now, the Italian Renaissance transformed painting from the least of the arts to the greatest. Um, Renaissance theorists recast painting on the model of philosophy and poetry, placing it on a par with the rest of the liberal arts. In fact, Renaissance painting not only became one of the liberal arts, but according to the theorist Ludovico Dolce, who was a, a Venetian theorist of the 16th century, painting subsumed all of the liberal arts within itself, transcending the so-called trivium and quadrivium, uh, into which the liberal arts were classically divided. Um, and whereas uh, Walter Pater, so Walter Pater was a 19th century aestheticist, so uh, an English theorist of art, um, famously claimed that all of the arts aspire to the condition of music. In the Italian Renaissance, all of the arts aspire to the condition of painting. Now, the history of the Renaissance is therefore the key to understanding academic art. Now, from George of Bizarre himself, to Jakob Burkhardt, who was the founder of the academic discipline of art history, as we know it today, to Ernst Gombrich, who wrote the most popular art history of the 20th century, art historians have told a wide variety of different stories about the Italian Renaissance. For Ernst Gombrich, the story of Renaissance art was one of evolving modes of perception. For Heinrich Wolfling, who was the most important student of Burkhardt's, uh, the history of Renaissance art was a story about the evolution of style from the linear to the painter. Uh, for Bernard Berenson, who was actually the um, uh, historian who advised uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner in the, a number of her purchases, uh, the Renaissance was a story about the advance of voluminous form. For Jakob Burkhardt himself, the Renaissance was the beginning of modern progress and secularization in particular. And yet, for the purposes of academic art, the history that really counts is the original story told by Giorgio Vasari of how the humblest art form became the most exalted. 
Vasari's Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, as he called it, which chronicles the lives of mostly Florentine artists from Cimabue to Michelangelo, stands in a category by itself as the founding document of art history, though what's rarely understood is that it is also the founding document of academicism. Vasari has often been unfairly criticized for his seemingly prejudicial prioritization of Florentine artists, as well as his severe judgment of Gothic and Byzantine art. But Vasari had very good reasons for being so discriminating, because the lives was designed to be the genealogy by which Vasari's Florentine Academy could assert its noble descent and claim the seat of Michelangelo. Um, now, like any claimant to a royal throne, the legitimacy of the academies was a function of their lineage. The academies claimed to be the legitimate successors of a long line of indisputably great artists whose accomplishments constituted an unassailable justification for academic hierarchies. It was on the strength of such arguments that the academies wielded almost uncontested power and authority over the fine arts for 300 years. Now, many art historians mistakenly place the beginning of the Renaissance at the turn of the 15th century, in the time of Filippo Brunelleschi, who built the Great Dome in Florence, and Lorenzo Ghiberti, um, or else in the mid 14th century to coincide with Petrarchan humanism. But Giorgio Vasari knew better beginning the lives at the very beginning, with biographies of Cimabue and Giotto, who lived circa 1300, and must be credited with creating the very first works of Renaissance art. Now, to visit the many frescoes and panel paintings by Giotto and Cimabue, which are still located in the Franciscan, Dominican, and Augustinian churches for which they were created, is to discover the source from which the Renaissance sprang like a seed in well-watered soil from the milieu of the High Middle Ages. There was precisely one art historian of the late 19th century by the name of Heinrich Tode, not very well known, who took Vasari at his word and correctly identified the medieval origin of Renaissance art. Tode's seminal book entitled St. Francis of Assisi and the Beginnings of the Art of the Renaissance in Italy traced the Italian Renaissance back to the most transformative Catholic saint of the Middle Ages, who along with Saint Dominic was responsible for establishing the mendicant orders, so the order of preachers and the order of friars minor, also known as the Franciscans and the Dominicans after their founders. Within decades of their founding, the Franciscans and the Dominicans built countless new churches around Italy and across Europe to serve the poor and decorated many of these churches, most notably the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi, um, in Assisi, with the original works of Renaissance art. Now the mendicants were the first to recognize the value of naturalistic art and pay artists to make it. The mendicants also expanded Europe's cultural horizons by sending Catholic missionaries all around the world. In fact, even Christopher Columbus was a third order Franciscan whose voyage across the Atlantic would never have been made if not for the evangelistic zeal of the Franciscans. In addition to fostering great art and exploration, the mendicants also included the greatest minds of the Middle Ages, from St. Bonaventure and Blessed John Duns Scotus to St. Thomas Aquinas, whose incorporation of Aristotle into Christian theology brought about a philosophical and theological renaissance. And, and by many accounts, really the beginning of what would become modern science. You know, it was in this context, circa 1300, that Dante wrote the Commedia, one of the greatest works of poetry ever written. And just a few decades later, that Petrarch became the father of Renaissance humanism. The mendicant movement was the root, while medieval Aristotelianism and Petrarchan humanism were the branches from which the Renaissance blossomed. For the liturgical, and devotional purposes of medieval Christianity prior to the mendicant movement, Gothic and Byzantine art were perfectly serviceable, and as a representation of the transcendent, they were perhaps even to be preferred to the naturalism of classical art. The ability to imitate nature is not terribly useful to an artist whose purpose is to depict that which uh, 
transcends appearances. So for centuries, Christian artists had no particular reason to go to the trouble of trying to paint things as they actually appear, when the point of Christian art was to represent that which does not appear, the invisible face of a hidden god. And yet in the 13th century, changing circumstances necessitated a reassessment of the artistic traditions which had prevailed for a thousand years. The idealizing abstraction of Byzantine art suggested a Platonizing or even a Manichaean um, spirituality averse to the material world. Now in the 12th and 13th centuries, the most popular and therefore the most dangerous heresy which assailed the medieval church was a Manichaean sect known as the Albigensians or the Cathars. Now it was for the express purpose of converting the Cathars that Saint Dominic began his preaching ministry and founded the Dominican order, motivated by the need to repudiate the Platonizing Manichaean spirituality which had infiltrated the medieval church and to communicate an authentically Christian spirituality, there began a shift away from golden domes and mosaics toward an art of the everyday and the ordinary, away from Byzantine idealization toward Renaissance naturalism, an art of fl real flesh and blood. Liturgical art was refocused on Jesus Christ, not just in glory, but also on earth, as in the mysteries of the rosary given to St. Dominic. It was Christ's human nature and passion on which Catholics were called to meditate. In the early centuries of the faith, it's important to understand that Christ was never represented on the cross. And even after the crucifix became a fixture in Catholic art in the sixth century, Christ was not usually represented in agony. Only in Renaissance art did the suffering Christ become the definitive symbol of the Catholic faith. And more than any other individual, it was St. Francis, who was the first stigmatic in church history, inspired this definitive meditation on the suffering body of Christ by bearing Christ's wounds in his own body. The ministry of St. Francis began while in prayer before a crucifix in the church of San Damiano, not far from Assisi. He heard a voice say to him three times, go and rebuild my church, which is falling into ruins. St. Francis took that commission literally and set about rebuilding San Damiano. In time, as hundreds and eventually thousands of other men and women began to embrace the same monastic life, Francis and his friars built churches all over Italy to serve the poor. Now, as the son of a textile merchant, Francis was keenly aware of the proto-industrial revolution sweeping across Europe in the 13th century. Because of the burgeoning textile industry, Italian cities like Florence experienced unprecedented population growth, and very large shanty towns grew up outside the city walls. Now, the people living in these shanty towns, who were much worse off than the average medieval serf living off the land, were the people whom Franciscan and Dominican churches were built to serve. Now, always located on the outskirts of the medieval city, Mendican churches were built of brick as opposed to stone because they needed to be built quickly. And they were always decorated in fresco in order to be a book for those who could not read because frescoes could be painted quickly and using inexpensive materials. So, so for example, you know, all you really need to make a fresco painting um, is uh, a, a little bit of plaster, all fundamentally, and, and some pigments that you can mix into it. It's, it's very inexpensive. Now, Giotto's frescoes were the poor man's substitute for stained glass and mosaic but paradoxically not a cheap substitute, because Giotto was able to achieve with common materials what glass and mosaic <coughs> could not, a true likeness of nature. As Dante confirms, there was no dearth of appreciation for Giotto's singular talents, and by the hand of Giotto, the humblest art began to be exalted. Now, Giotto's turn to naturalism was intimately related to the philosophical turn by Franciscan and Dominican theologians to Aristotle, which was a revolutionary development, considering that for the previous 1,200 years of church history, Platonism and Neoplatonism had defined the terms of theological discourse. Now, the chief advantage of Aristotelianism over Platonism for the purposes of Christian theology was its comparatively positive view of the body, 
which comported well with doctrines like the Incarnation and the Resurrection. While a Platonist would say that the human soul is the essence of a human being, and the body a mere prison of the soul, Aristotle understood the body to be an essential part of what a human being is, as both a body and a soul in one substance. Now, for the purposes of mimetic arts like painting, the primary advantage of Aristotelianism over Platonism was Aristotle's theory of knowledge. Now, Aristotle's metaphysics derives its very name, which means after physics, from Aristotle's procedure of reasoning from the sensate to the abstract, on the premise that knowledge begins in the senses. And while the Platonic approach to painting, implicit in Byzantine art, entailed reasoning up to ideal forms, um, so, for example, like a geometer um, arriving at the ideal form of a triangle. Um, the Aristotelian approach of Renaissance painting entailed abstracting out the universal from the direct observation of nature. Okay, so the Platonist imitates an innate mental representation of the ideal, while an Aristotelian imitates what he sees, which is a big difference. Now, as Michelangelo wrote, my soul can find no stair, to mount to heaven, save for its loveliness. Now, Plato, by contrast, famously doubted the merits of mimetic arts like painting and sculpture as a mere imitation of appearances two steps removed from the ultimate reality of the ideal forms. But Aristotle had no such skepticism. And to make a long story short, Plato was a critic of classical art, while Aristotle was its defender. Now, this needs to be stressed particularly because a great deal of unfounded nonsense has been written by many art historians about the supposed Platonism of Michelangelo and Botticelli, which is just, don't believe it, it's garbage. Renaissance art, like all of the arts and sciences in the Middle Ages, was downstream from theology as the queen of the arts and sciences. And there was no theologian more influential in the late Middle Ages than St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomism pervaded the air of Renaissance Florence, from the Dominican monastery of San Marco, actually I live right around the corner from there, to the Dominican church of Santa Maria Novella. The greatest Florentine painter of the early Quattrocento, Fra Angelico, was a Dominican friar, educated in Thomistic theology, as was the later, the infamous, I should say, Savonarola, whose fiery sermons exerted an infamous sway over Sandro Bocelli and whose biblical commentary Michelangelo all but devoted to memory. Now, notwithstanding how little the scholastics, like uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, had to say about art and beauty, um, prompting Leon Battista Alberti, the most important theorist of Renaissance art, to pass over their contribution to his theory in perfect silence, it was Dominican and Franciscan theologians who unified the sacred and profane aims of Renaissance art by bringing together into a single unified system the best that had been thought and said by both pagan and Christian authors. Now, in Thomism, to make this very simple, to see the connection between Thomism and Renaissance art, the soul is what makes the body human, but the body is what gives the soul its individuality. Ideal form, conceived merely as a as a distillation of what things of a kind share in common, is not what is ultimately real. That's, that's what Plato believed, roughly speaking, that what is the ultimately real is that ideal form, a kind of pure essence that everybody shares in common. Um, but for Aristotle, reality is individuated. Reality has to be that form in order to become fully real, in order to become a real substance, and not just an abstract idea, has to be instantiated in matter. And therefore, the real, what is ultimately real, is individuated, okay? Now, the practical implication of this idea for the purposes of art is that art needed to express not only the universal, but also the individual. You have to capture them both. You have to paint form and matter. You have to capture both the ideal and appearances, okay? And so, coming back to my text here, let's see. Okay, and so Thomism implied that in order to paint things as they really are, the painter must capture both the universal and the particular at a single stroke of the brush, achieving an elusive union of appearances and the ideal. And so the Renaissance painter, in order to accomplish this, painted from life by directly observing nature. Though he did not essentialize deformity by slavishly copying what he saw, but at the same time, 
imitated an idea of beauty. So you, you've got both. You've got the Aristotelian, you've got the Platonism. You're not necessarily rejecting Plato, you're just bringing Plato and Aristotle together and expressing both the ideal and the concrete in one image. Let's see, so recounting, oh, actually, this is um, evidenced by a lot that Alberti himself says in the first treatise on painting. So recounting the cautionary tale of the ancient painter Demetrius, who fell short of the mark because he paid too much attention to appearances to the exclusion of the ideal, Alberti advised the painter to emulate the famous Zoixis instead, who captured the beautiful Helen of Troy by selecting the best features of five different women. Now, as illustrated by German painters like Lucas Cronach and uh, Albrecht Durer, there was always a competing tendency in the broader tradition of Renaissance painting towards styles suggested not of Thomism, but of an entirely different philosophy, which also came from a Franciscan theologian, uh, namely William of Ockham. Now, Renaissance humanism, actually, has a very bad reputation for being anti-Aristotelian, uh, oddly enough because humanists were disdainful of scholastic philosophy, which they found pedantic. And Petra Petrarch himself, who founded Renaissance humanism, uh, was in fact what's called a nominalist. Now nominalism, uh, to make a very long story short, uh, simply is the belief that universals um, are not real, but merely names for categorizing the particular. So to a nominalist, um, only the particular, only the concrete, is actually real. Only the individual is real. There's no actual universal categories into which things actually really belong. And so that's an extreme kind of materialism. Now, um, for the purposes of painting, the implication of nominalism is that the painting most faithful to the particular, to the exclusion of the ideal, is the most true. And so actually, it's, well, I'll, I'll get to that. Hang on a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, so nominalism was never countenanced by the academies, but it happens to be a perfect description of the working philosophy of Gustave Courbet. So you think of uh, 19th century French art, you have this host of French painters who begin uh, rebelling against the academies and saying, no, we don't want these fake, phony, idealized figures. We want to paint things as they really are, as they actually look. But of course the paradox is that what came to be known as French quote unquote realism is actually a rejection of classical realism. It's a rejection of the belief in universals um, and it's founded on a very, um, a very materialistic belief that, that actually, no, the, the only thing that exists is the particular. The only thing that exists is the individual. Now, and so the partisan divisions of French art in the mid 19th century between academicism and the French avant-garde originated in the philosophical debates of the Middle Ages. And so the evolution of style is not just an organic development unfolding inevitably and naturally according to a logic which is internal to the craft, as described, for example, by the art historian Heinrich Wolfling. Um, but in fact, it is a truly historical phenomenon. The avant-garde carried nominalism to its logical conclusion, um, even as the academies remained steadfastly Aristotelian in the 19th century. And as a matter of fact, the earlier opposition of classicist and colorist within the academies, which again, waged in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, um, descended from exactly the same philosophical roots. And in fact, the subordination, so the academies were also infamous for subordinating color to drawing. And so the, the, the stodgy, uh, curmudgeonly academicians who, who were steadfastly Aristotelian insisted that drawing is the most important thing and color is, you know, whatever, color is that that thing that titillates the senses but isn't, isn't terribly intellectually stimulating or important. And, um, and this actually came from Aristotle, who, um, again, according to Aristotle, real beauty, according to Aristotle, as opposed to the superficial sensory pleasures of bright colors and sweet flavors, depends on magnitude and order, qualities of design, in other words, whereby beauty addresses the rational intellect. Now, of course, um, I don't want to misrepresent Petrarch or Petrarchan humanism. Um, what, what I've said so far would, might lead you to believe that Petrarch was the bad guy, uh, according to me. Um, but, <laughs> but apart from Petrarch's nominalism, actually, his influence over artists was extraordinarily positive, um, at least for the purposes of the academic tradition. Um, Renaissance humanism, it is said, began with Petrarch's rediscovery of the letters of Marcus Tullius Cicero in 1345, so way back in the 14th century. 
Now, if not a few years earlier, when Petrarch had himself crowned poet laureate in Rome on April the 8th, 1341, in recognition of his having written the epic poem entitled Africa, which was about Hannibal's invasion of Italy and Rome's subsequent invasion of North Africa under the legendary Roman general uh, the Scipio Africanus. Now, Petrarch, what Petrarch's claim to fame is that he drew the battle lines between the ancients and the moderns. Now, prior to Petrarch, you really do not have modern poets attempting to write great Latin poetry. You have a lot of academic literature being written. You have people writing commentaries on classical texts, writing commentaries about all of the, the ancient Roman classics. But what you don't have um, are current, contemporary poets trying to rival the ancients at their own game. And that's what Petrarch did. He said, no, I'm going to write Latin better than Cicero. And, and quite frankly, by the end of the Renaissance, this is really what, what had happened. I mean, the greatest works, in my opinion at least, of Latin poetry and prose don't come from antiquity. <laughs> they come from the Renaissance, which is quite amazing. Okay, but of course, for the purposes of painters, sculptors, and architects, you know, Pet, the effect of Petrarch's influence was to motivate them to do the same thing in their respective disciplines. So just as Petrarch was saying, I'm going to beat the Latins in Latin, um, he inspired painters to say, I'm going to paint better than Apelles, and sculptors to say, I'm going to, I'm going to paint better um, than ancient, the, the best ancient sculptors. And, and that's what they tried to do. And, and you could argue, you know, looking at the greatest accomplishments of Renaissance art, the greatest works of Renaissance architecture, the greatest works of Renaissance sculpture, are they not greater than the greatest works that survived from antiquity? Perhaps they do. You know. um, and so it was under Petrarch's influence that painters carried the art of painting up the steep slopes of Mount Parnassus into the realm of poetic inspiration. What elevates high art is fundamentally a question of its purpose. The purpose of high art um, is not just to please the senses, but also to communicate truths of great importance. Uh, in other words, to please and instruct, as Horace writes in his poem, The Art of Poetry. Great art teaches us about the nature of things by showing us, for example, what it means, say, to be human. The paradigmatic forms of high art are poetry and rhetoric. Why? Because it is in language that truth is expressed originally. And it is in language that human knowledge attains the greatest heights. Hence, from the very first Renaissance treatise on painting by Leon Battista Alberti to the very last by Ludovico Dolce, the craft of painting was elevated to the status of a liberal art by deliberately modeling it on the arts of rhetoric and poetry. Now, theorists of painting applied the canons of classical rhetoric to painting, the first and most important of which is invention. Now, in a typical grammar school education, the first subject of study, once students had a passable grasp of Latin, was Cicero's De Invenzione, on invention, which might also be translated on the discovery of an argument. It was an eminently practical textbook for the majority of students who were headed either for the clergy or for the law, who needed to be skilled in the art of persuasion. Now, with respect to painting, the challenge of rhetorical invention is to select a story previously told by poets or historians and to depict it in a novel and ingenious way. Now, the subject matter of a classical painting would not, as a rule, be made up out of whole cloth. Uh, because invention in the classical sense of the word is a discovery and not creation out of nothing. Now, it's hardly a criticism, for example, of William Shakespeare's powers of invention that he never invented a, stray, a, a play completely from scratch. The story is the poet's or the artist's raw material upon which his genius goes to work, not to use the story merely as an occasion for the display of skill, but to free the story to be what it really is, to become itself again, having become old and stale. Every new representation of an old story rejuvenates it. Now, the more formulaic or old-fashioned a painting looks, or maybe that's the wrong word, <laughs> the more formulaic or redundant a painting looks, don't want to indict myself here, um, the less it tends to communicate. 
uh, let's see, the less it tends to communicate, since a viewer is unlikely to look very closely at a painting which is too recognizable, supposing that he already knows what he will see. Who needs eyes when one has knowledge? Only the unforeseen can interrupt this kind of thoughtlessness or prevent the work of art from devolving, like advertising or propaganda, into a mere conceptual instrument. Now, in an original painting, the subject appears to us as if for the very first time, because the work boldly proclaims the fact of its existence, compelling one to stop and look and ponder diverse interpretations. Now, the application of the canon of invention to painting meant that Renaissance painters could not just be copyists like Byzantine artists, but needed to design original compositions, and that their originality should not be capricious, but needed to take the form of a rhetorical argument by appeal, following Aristotle's categories of argument, to reason, authority, and emotion. Italian Renaissance painters appealed to reason in very obvious ways by inventing principles of linear perspective, by dissecting human anatomy, and by mastering chiaroscuro, using light and shadow to create an effect of volume and depth. Painters appealed to emotion by representing the human body in lively expressive action with dramatic gestures and facial expressions. And the Venetians in particular achieved diverse moods through their judicious use of color. Painters also appealed, lastly, to authority by emulating the great works of previous artists. Now, of Aristotle's three modes of argument, the appeal to authority calls for special attention. Now, in the 15th century, there was only one authority which could be recommended by Alberti, with a narrow exception made for classical statuary, which again inspired the tradition of learning to draw from plaster casts. And that authority was the infallible authority of nature as a book written by God. Never doubt, and this is a quote, that the head and principle of this art, and thus every one of its degrees in becoming a master, ought to be taken from nature, according to Alberti. Alberti discouraged the painter from copying other painters. Don't copy. Lest one adopt another's mannerisms. And the same view is expressed repeatedly by Leonardo da Vinci in his notebooks. Now this exclusive authority of nature ended with the Renaissance. And although the appeal to authority is the weakest basis on which to make an argument, as St. Thomas Aquinas ironically claimed on the authority of Boethius, the paradox is that there is more certainty in a divinely inspired authority uh, than infallible human reasoning. And by crediting the likes of Michelangelo with divine inspiration, Giorgio Vasari made a very bold claim about Michelangelo's authority. Divine revelation takes precedence over natural revelation, and so the divine Michelangelo took precedence over the imitation of nature. And although the idolization of Michelangelo promptly, indeed immediately, decayed into mannerism, nature's authority was never exclusive in the academic tradition. Once the craft had reached a degree of sophistication, as it unquestionably had by the High Renaissance in the works of Titian, in the works of Rembrandt, I'm sorry, not Rembrandt, in the works of Michelangelo, sorry. Um, and so it only made sense to build on what others had done. Now, derivative though it may be to imitate Rembrandt, it is, you know, it's, it's stupid to reinvent the wheel for fear of being derivative. Now, Rembrandt's protégés, like Ferdinand Boll, you know, had no compunction about it replicating his skill set, which they had worked so hard to acquire. And those artists trained in the academy, so Ferdinand Bolt, just to give you a, a short rundown, um, there were basically two systems of education for the entirety of the tradition. There were some artists who were exclusively trained by apprenticeship, and there were other artists who studied in the academies. Um, and by and large, artists who only trained by apprenticeship were mostly, uh, you, you find them in Holland, you find them in some of the German countries. Um, Mostly they painted things like still life and landscape and portraiture. Um, the elevated genres of history painting, of uh, great you know, altar pieces and so forth, um, tended not, they weren't exclusively, but were primarily made um, by artists trained in the academies. And so there was a bit, of a bit of a division there. And so artists who were trained in the academies did look askance at the kind of very uh, faithful, you might say, slavish imitation that you find in these much more craft-oriented traditions. 
Um, but even so, artists who were trained in the academies were still taught to make arguments by appeal to authority. They were still taught to imitate, albeit in a sophisticated way. Okay? And so they were taught to make, create their inventions, their pictorial inventions, like, like a legal argument by appeal to sound precedent, building atop one another's accomplishments in that way. Now, to understand the principles of derivation in academic art, you really have to look at the works of Raphael. Um, derivation of the kind epitomized by Raphael's works was really the pivot on which academic invention turned, uh, which is why Raphael became the most celebrated representative of the Italian Renaissance in the academic tradition. Now, this is something of an historical irony, because, of course, um, there were two uh, really, in the Renaissance, there were really two schools. There was the Florentine school and there was the Venetian school, to make a very complicated story very simple. Um, and the two uh, really great works of literature defending each one, respectively, were uh, Vasari's Lives in defense of the Florentine tradition and uh, Ludovico Dolce's Dialogue on Painting in defense of the Venetian tradition. Um, Vasari presented Michelangelo as the great hero, the king of the arts, and so forth. Um, Dolce presented the Venetian painter Titian, Tiziano Vecellio, as the greatest artist of the High Renaissance. And so you have these two traditions, one going back to Michelangelo, another going back to Titian. But the paradox is that by certainly the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, it was really Raphael, who didn't really have any defenders, oddly enough, in his own time, who became the most important representative of academic art. And the reason is that Raphael was already doing in the High Renaissance what academic painters started doing after the Renaissance. And so Raphael was more um, beloved, for example, by Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre, one of the greatest French artists of the early 19th century, because Raphael showed him how to develop a unique style within the limits of the tradition. And as Joshua Reynolds explains in his discourses, what distinguishes the works of Raphael is that they illustrate a sustainable model of originality through creative imitation, but immune to the diminishing returns of unruly Michelangesque genius. And so, for example, the ideas first of Perugino, um, and then of Leonardo da Vinci, and later of the Venetian artist Sebastiano del Piombo and of Michelangelo, were imitated and absorbed into Raphael's art, and without too much alteration, used to produce a completely new style of the highest caliber, which was more graceful than his sources of influence. And there's also a mythic appeal to Raphael's personal narrative because of his premature death, long before his own genius for invention had been exhausted. And his unrealized potential became emblematic of the possibilities still latent in Renaissance art, which each subsequent generation of academic painters would strive to realize. And not only did Raphael show how the thoughtful recombination of previous ideas could furnish opportunities for innovation sufficient to rival the highest standard of art, but the logic of his myth implied that the advance of the craft could be sustained in perpetuity. And by following Raphael's example, artists continued to innovate, and when they pushed the boundaries of tradition, they did so to advance the craft rather than to tear it down. Now, Derivation was also one means of poaching the aura of a venerated masterpiece. Now, to present a new and likely unheralded work of art successfully, as I'm attempting to do here, as an object of, is to present the object um, as a thing of aesthetic veneration. And so, what we have to understand is that um, you know, painting, everything pertaining to the aesthetic is a very short step removed from religious ritual. Um, that in the same way that you have saints and relics in the Catholic Church, um, the whole logic of the Renaissance tradition is a kind of aestheticized, allegorized, somewhat secularized version of the same thing applied to culture, applied to art. And so um, in order for an uncelebrated artist to assert himself, to um, ascend the tradition, to become um, appreciated, to, to see that, to make art, first of all, that they deserved um, to be venerated the way that the great masterpieces of the High Renaissance were, he had to defer to an origin beyond himself. He had to point to those great works of art in his own paintings. And so, for example, let's see here, I'm getting a little too far from my guess. So it's very conspicuous, just, just to give you an illustration, 
and that Raphael, um, actually when he was still very young as a matter of fact, bought himself a burial plot of all places in the Pantheon in Rome. Now, at the time that he did this, nobody was being buried in the Pantheon. This was, a, this, this was his own idea. And the reason that he did this was precisely because he wanted to present himself as a member of the new and emergent pantheon of great artists. And he actually made himself a, you know, a, a burial stone, or whatever you would call it for that space, um, with an inscription on it, very much to that effect. And, uh, and he actually wrote the inscription himself, praising himself. It's, it's not terribly humble, but at any rate, it's... Um, but, but this is really what it was all about, that these guys understood that they were in the business of frankly, of becoming, if you will, secular saints, of becoming part of a new canon of art. And they were absolutely all about um, mythologizing their own works and mythologizing their own story. And, and they did it extremely successfully. In fact, even um, Michelangelo, it's really, it's really kind of amusing. I mean, Vasari's biography of Michelangelo is extremely praised. He just praises him left and right. He has so many good things to say about Michelangelo this and Michelangelo that. <laughs> And Michelangelo just wasn't satisfied. In fact, he was so dissatisfied with Vasari's uh, hagiography that he actually um, hired uh, an, another, uh, another author, Condivi, by the name of Condivi, uh, to write another biography. And as a matter of fact, Michelangelo really wrote the biography himself, but allowed Condivi to put his name on it. <laughs> and so it's, uh, this, this was the kind of man that they were. But um, at any rate, but I want to come back to uh, the logic of derivation. So it was all. Fundamentally, it was all an artist could do to present his case, if you will, for this kind of secular canonization by summoning his witnesses between the borders of the frame uh, through the development, <clears throat> I'm sorry, through the deployment of the most authoritative sources. So the, the key in order, if you want to make a new painting, you have to cite great paintings. That, I mean, to make it, make it very simple for you. Um, if you want your paintings to be recognized as an academician back in the, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, you have to cite the best paintings in your paintings, and you have to rival them. You have to make paint new paintings that are just as good, but you have, to, you have to appeal to them. You have to present them in your own canvas. You have to contend with them. You have to show them, look, I can do this too, and I can do it better. You know, you can, you can quote Michelangelo, and you can beat Michelangelo, and that, that was the idea. That was the intention. All right, that just about wraps up um, my talk for today. Um, I, I do want to encourage all of you, if you haven't already, uh, to take a look at the catalog, to take a look um, possibly at the YouTube videos that I, I made of the catalog. So you don't actually have to read it if you don't like reading. You can also listen to them. Um, and, uh, and so you'll learn a lot more about all the paintings that I have on display here and, and a little bit more about my history and philosophy as well. That pretty much wraps it up. Are there any, any questions by any chance? So everyone thought it was perfectly lucid and didn't lose anyone with all of his crazy names and, and so forth. Okay, well that's good. Well, I guess we'll have to call it call it a day. Well, thank you, thank you all for. Yes, yes. Oh, I do have a question. Okay. Um, I've noticed um, technical. I mean, everything is very technically beautiful and very skillful. I've noticed significant technical difficulties with the Vasari paintings. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about how the technical difficulties affect the softness and the portraits versus some of the more allegorical ones. Can you explain your intention on that? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, for for my history paintings. I really wanted to paint works that were in the tradition of Florentine art, specifically. I didn't want them to look Venetian, I didn't want them to look 19th century, I wanted them to look Florentine. And Florentine art has certain defining characteristics. Florentine art, um, it has a very solid, blocky local color. So you don't get a lot of variegation in the color, you don't get a lot of texture in the color, you get this very solid, very clear. Clarity is really the key word. Very solid, very clear local colors in Florentine art. You also have pretty sharp edges. Um, now, if my teachers from art school were to see some of these paintings, they would be wagging their fingers at me and saying, you're, you're making those edges too sharp. And, and they would probably be right. But, but the reason, <laughs> the reason that I, I decided, um, especially in my history paintings, to, to gravitate toward a more hard edge uh, aesthetic was because I wanted to evoke the Florentine school. I wanted to look like Florentine paintings look, which from Botticelli to Michelangelo to pick your favorite Florentine artist, um, have very sharp edges, and so that was one of the intentions as well. Um, for my portraiture, I got a little bit outside of the stylistic bounds of my history painting. So, for example, I have a, 
sort of an imitation Rembrandt um, back there of uh, Friar Roger Bacon. Um, I have a portrait imitating the works of Titian back in the corner as well. Um, another uh, imitating, of course, Leonardo. And, and, so, um, and so stylistically, those paintings had different demands, and so that's why they have a slightly different, different style. Thank you. No problem. Could you talk a little bit about your own academic history? Oh, sure, of course. Um, so I went to a school in uh, Florence, Florence, Italy, I guess between about 2006 and 2009. Um, and it was called the Angel Academy. It still exists. It's still, people, people can still go there. Um, and it, uh, I, there I, I learned how to draw and I learned how uh, to paint a little bit. And um, it, was a, it was an excellent, very, um, very rigorous uh, academic education and precisely the kinds of things that I needed to know to do to do this kind of art. Um, it was it was a very uh, abbreviated education in some ways, though I really wasn't able to stay there quite as long as I would have liked to. But but it was enough to, to get me started. And um, and then after so after my time that was really all the art school that I had. And after my time in Florence, I went to uh, I went to Paris for a year as well with some other artists who were graduates from the school. And we set up a little studio outside the city. And I spent the year just doing nothing but doing studies of the paintings in the, in the Louvre and in the Musée d'Orsay, and, and um, just studying and on my own and doing doing that kind of thing. And then I came home, and, and for the last you know 10, 12 years, I've been desperately trying to figure out how to do this. Yes. So, I mean, I just love, kind of with the talk, how you mentioned all the philosophy and history, um, from Vasari to Alberti, kind of this whole canon of history that goes behind your work and your practice. And I know you kind of mentioned earlier, and something that I saw in your catalog is that, unfortunately, kind of the art world today, um, certainly a large majority of it, focusing on deconstruction, tends to kind of disparage this sort of work, which beautiful and I'd love to study in this tradition as well. But kind of a question, because I'm a student at an art school, and kind of a question that to me and similar like other students that are aspiring to be figure painters are kind of faced with is that when teachers look at this work, kind of look at the Renaissance tradition, kind of in a critique, um, and I guess kind of in a questioning way, they say, what purpose does this work serve in like the contemporary age? Which I was just wondering, have you ever been faced with that kind of like questioning? And if so, how would you well, respond sure, to sure. it? Well, well, the the short answer that I would give is that postmodernism is dead, and the schools just haven't figured it out yet. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, the longer answer would be that um, you know the purpose of art, and, and this is very un postmodern of me, but um, you know the, the purpose of, of art, of high art, as as it actually as I mentioned in the talk, um, is um, is not only to please but to instruct, not only to show. Um, uh, something that's pleasing to look at, but also also to teach us something, to teach us something about how things really are. Um, that, and actually I talk a lot more about this in, in the catalog, if you can take a look at the catalog, you'll discover this, that um, what art is really about, classical art is really about, um, is showing us things for what they are. It's, it's saying on, on the assumption, we, we assume, okay, reality is knowable. Reality is knowable, it's out there, and it's external to us, and it can be known. And the classical painter is investigating that reality, saying, okay, well, what is that reality? Let me see if I can capture it. Let me see if I can paint it. And then he's trying to express that and saying, this is the reality that you're somehow, that maybe is lost to us most of the time. Most of the time we're blind. Most of the time we can't see. What is the painting trying to do? The painting is trying to show us a view of reality that actually shows us reality as it really is. And that's what the painter's trying to do. Now, of course, this sounds very funny to people who think that idealization is very unreal, to people who think that ide you know, idealizing pictures are precisely the opposite of the real. Well, then this leads to a philosophical discussion like the kind that I was discussing here. Well, if you want to talk about what reality is, then we have to do some metaphysics if you really want to have that conversation. But what I am saying here with these kinds of paintings, with this kind of, kind of idealization, is precisely that I'm making a statement about the nature of reality. I'm saying that I'm not a novelist. I believe that things have a nature which can be known. I believe that there's such a thing as human nature, and that, that human nature is not malleable. Um, that obviously there's a range of potential that can be expressed, and you know, people there's there's a diversity of ways in which people can potentially express their authentic human nature. But but at the same time, there's a reality that we have to conform ourselves to. Now, you know, what is the postmodernist going to say? Well, the postmodernist, of course, is very much opposed to the idea that reality can be. And the postmodernist 
uh, is what might be called uh, believes in our postmodernism is a philosophy you could call a philosophy of extreme transcendence. And what I mean by that is that you know someone like Michel Foucault looks at reality and says, okay, there's a reality there, there's something outside me, but I can't get to it. It's just, it's unknowable. And so the quintessential postmodernist is an extreme agnostic. He has blinders over his eyes. All you have is the world of representation. All you have is cultural contingency to a postmodernist. Reality as it really is, is there, but you can't get to it. It's just, it's just stuck behind this facade that you can't get past. And so um, my answer to that is I don't believe in that philosophy. I don't, I don't accept that. I don't think reality is quite unknowable. There's a difference between reality and appearances, and appearances don't perfectly, sh you know, we don't have immediate access to reality as such, um, but we do have access to it. That you can, you know, there's not, it's not as though there's no relationship between representation and reality. It's not as though there's no relationship between how things appear to us and how they actually are. And so um, the, the, the short answer to the postmoderns is, is simply that they're, they're, they have bad metaphysics, they have bad philosophy, and, and that they need to get past it. Because, and then bad philosophy produces bad art. No, no great surprise. So that's, that's my answer. Thank you very much. No problem. We're building on philosophy. For you in this collection, what was the most challenging philosophically and maybe most challenging technically? <laughs> You know, it was probably the first one because that was, a, so this was the, um, the first history painting that I attempted um, all the way back in 2013 to 2015. And uh, just because the learning curve was so steep, and at least in terms of the, you know, the mechanics of figuring out how to do it, um, that was probably the most, the most difficult. I think it, it ultimately was quite successful. I'm very pleased with how it turned out. Um, but it was definitely the most challenging just to get over the learning curve. Um, philosophically, you know, the, the philosophical work's a little funny to me. I mean, you know, the strange thing is that when, you know, when I formed the idea of what I wanted to do when I graduated from school, I didn't necessarily have all of the philosophical understanding that I have now. I wasn't terribly well read. I didn't have, I didn't necessarily have the intellectual foundation that I needed to do this, but I kind of had an intuition of what it was that I wanted to do. And I, I, I forged ahead in the right direction and figured out the justifications for it after the fact. And so, um, you know, as far as the philosophy goes, the strange thing is that as I've learned more about what it is that I'm doing, um, it hasn't really, I mean, the philosophy has not changed the way that I paint. Um, it's rather the way that I paint that has sort of led me to discover the, the reasons for it. But, yes, Sunder. I'm vaguely aware that there was a relationship between many artists and their, their models, their, their subjects. And um, in fact, many artists. Um, Relied upon painting portraits for uh, for commissions to uh, support themselves, and, and I'm, I'm looking for for a a, a, a self portrait a portrait of your parents. <laughs> I don't see it. <laughs> well, I've got a portrait of my mother on my easel at home at the moment, so I'm working on that. Um, I I did do a self portrait that's actually pictured in the catalog, but I I sold it a long time ago, and so I don't have that one. I do have another one at home that I wasn't able to include in the exhibition because it was a little bit too big to, it wouldn't fit, but well, there's, there's a I do have a casual. Maybe you can recruit some models. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, exactly. That's what I do. <laughs> Very good. All right, but shall we call it a day? I have one final Okay, question. go ahead. So you talked a lot about how trends evolved and mm -hmm. changing, and some seminal work that kind of captured those trends, but how did that information get diffused? Because in your story, it seems like things changed quite, like philosophies changed very frequently and then got diffused through the academy and then the students kind of emulated and then went on to kind of spread the word. But what was the vehicle for that? What was the public square or where did people get these ideas and then go on to Disseminate them further. Well, that's a very good idea. A very good question. You know, um, if we go all the way back to um, really the 13th century, so the 1200s, um, when the Franciscans and the Dominicans were founded, and you have this just explosion of new ideas and new buildings and and um, across Europe, it, the the primary vehicles were uh, were the church and the university, um, and so you have uh, first of all you have people preaching. I mean. Both the Franciscans and the Dominicans were, above all else, preachers. They went around, they talked to people, <laughs> and they spread their ideas. And so, and, and the university system, likewise, 
um, was not only forming but also disseminating um, the the new Aristotelianism to um, to educate among educated people. And so, on the one hand, you have educated people um, going to these uh, these already at that time already venerable you know, university systems universities, and and for even for ordinary people, you also have um, uh, you, you also have the mendicant orders um, teaching people who many of whom couldn't read um, a lot of the same things um, simply through their preaching. Um, by the time you get to, uh, of course, the you know the fifteenth century, you have the invention of the printing press. Okay, and so once you have books, um, it, it then became much easier to disseminate this kind of information. And so, for example, um, Alberti's uh, first so the very first treatise on painting written by Leon Battista Alberti. Uh, was written within a few years of the invention of the printing press. And so already at that time, it was possible for that book to be published, it was possible for artists all over Europe to read it um, within a very short period of its being written, and, and indeed it continued to be read um, for, you know, for hundreds of years thereafter. Um, and so, um, yeah, I would say those, those are the primary vehicles. So first the, the church, the university, and, and ultimately the printing press. <laughs> Well, thank, I want to thank all of you for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Do you have an artist's website? Yes, it's just so it's my name, Benjamin-Patterson.com.